Kids can uh, head to the kid thing. <laughs> what do we call that? What is it? Children's church. Children's church. Yes. Yeah, there's a chicken in there today. A live one. Oh, there's two chickens, actually. I've been corrected by an eight-year-old. Mm. Good morning. How are we doing? We good? All right, all right. I'm, uh, I'm excited, of course. I get uh, excited about this kind of stuff, and uh, I get jazzed, and I get involved, and it gets intense, and I usually get challenged on the things that I'm always going to speak on, because I'm no different than you, so I battle these same things. Everything that I'm going to talk about today is a huge battle in my life, and, and if you're honest, it's equally as a large battle in your own. So today's message is the kingdom of God, which is also the kingdom of heaven, two. I was going to say part do, but I don't know. <laughs> you should have. But to recap what we talked about last week is we talked about the kingdom of God. We talked about, um, there it is. God, yeah, it's awesome. I got a little pedal right over there. Uh, that God created everything through the light. Remember when we talked about that in Genesis, that God created the light, and the light was Christ, and everything, everything that you see, everybody that you see here, everything was created through Christ. Because we were talking about the basic, fundamental, basic, foundational stuff that we all have to understand about the kingdom of God. That was one thing we talked about. The second thing is God will redeem his people. I didn't bring my Bible up here, but pretend I got a Bible in my hand. God, in his Bible, in our book, in his word, we've learned through what creation was through the light. We learned what the light was, and at the end we learned that how God was actually going to redeem the whole thing, which includes you in his kingdom where he will reign. That's what we talked about last week as well. The third thing is you, we want to desire the kingdom of God. We pray for it. We always say, uh, your kingdom come, thy, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray that all the time, but we need to want that in our lives right now. Like, not when Christ comes and redeems everything. Yeah, we want it then, too, but you've got to want to desire that now, that in your life now. We talked about what some of the first steps would be. Like, okay, I, I got the foundation, Kevin. I believe that God created everything. I believe that Jesus is exactly who he is. He's the Savior. To, so I am able to be in the kingdom, not because of what I am capable of doing or what I haven't done or what I'm no good at doing and what I tear apart and destroy. It's who he is, who Christ is, is how I am able to even be in the presence of God in his kingdom. Follow that so far? Because last week we finished up we didn't finish up on it, but one of the verses towards the end of the, the message was Revelation 21, 27. Because the reason why Christ is redeeming everything the way that he is is for you to surrender your will to his because your sin cannot be in the kingdom of God. Because in Revelation 21, 27 says, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, we know this. Another foundational thing. We're saying, okay, we believe this. We believe that's what God's gonna do is redeem everything at the end. And the only way the abominations and the lie aren't there is because of Christ, not because you got so good at not doing it. Right? We talked a little bit about repentance and again, I want to drill this down really, really deep today. This is fundamental. This is a, you have to get to this point in your life. You, at some point in time, you have to wrestle with this. You have no way around 
repentance. You can, you can justify your actions, you can justify your life, you can justify every, we, in fact, that's what we do, isn't it? But you have to accept exactly what repentance is. And on the next slide, I'm gonna show you exactly what the New Testament Greek translation of the word metaneo, which is repent. This is the full definition of it. To think differently or afterwards means to think about something differently after the fact. Reconsider morally to change one's mind for the better. And this is what we're gonna drill in on today right here is heartily to amend with abhorrence with one's past sins. To amend, do, I sometimes sit there and think we all know what every word means. You know, we all graduated from high school, hopefully, or at least we're getting through there, or we're halfway smart, that we understand some of these words, but I don't want to ever assume that. To amend means to change, to alter your heart, heartily to amend. To reconsider. So it's thinking and considering the sin in your life to change your heart with abhorrence. That's a crazy word. Repulsion. Disgusted. You loathe your sin. You, you have abhorrence for the sin, your sin in your life, in your heart. Because that is what makes you broken. And we sit there and think, well, broken's bad. I'm gonna show you today that that's exactly where Christ wants you. Like, okay, wait a minute. Doesn't he want me to have all these amazing things, an amazing life? Uh, maybe. But I can tell you for sure, he wants your heart broken because this is repentance, what I just read to you. This is what Christ said where you need to be. I want you to listen closely to the scripture that we're gonna go over. It's Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51... I'm gonna cover it very slowly. I know I usually read scripture very fast because I throw a lot of it up there, but today we're gonna to go through this slow. And I want you to look at every line because this is David's prayer of repentance. So this is what repentance looks like. Everything I just explained to you is now in scripture form, beautifully. And you can't change a thing about it because it's absolutely perfect. Oh, it's already up there, great. Have mercy upon me, O oh God. This is David praying to God. Let me explain to you how we even got to this prayer. This is after David called up Bathsheba, ends up impregnating her, has her husband killed. Have any of you done that? Have you killed anybody lately? David did, and he's the man after God's own heart, right? Okay, so the, this happened. And then Nathan comes to him. Nathan was a prophet, came to David in his temple and said, David, you have to hear this case. And so David says, fine, tell me what's going on. And Nathan says, there's a man who has a thousand sheep, a thousand sheep, and then his neighbor has one. I'm paraphrasing here. His neighbor has one. And the man with a thousand had some guests come over and he went and grabbed the neighbor's sheep that only had one. He grabbed his sheep and slaughtered it for a feast. And David, in righteous anger, slams his fist down and says, this man must be, this man must be killed. He must be brought before me and beheaded. Done. History. This man needs to be wiped off the face of the earth. And Nathan looked at David and said, you're that man. I got goosebumps. You're that man. Then David does this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Remember, mercy means grace and forgiveness with it out being deserved. You, you didn't earn it. Mercy's a gift. Mercy is what's been given. So he's begging for God's mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Get rid of them. Take them away. What just happened? My heart is broken and I'm terrified what I've just done. I'm horrified by it. Take it away. Wash me 
thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge, David is saying, I know what I did. Past sin, reconsider, I want to amend it. This is what I did. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He always knew it was there. It was always just there. Do you think maybe he did what we do, just keeps himself busy so he didn't have to think about what he did? Oh, I got kingdom stuff to do. I got this, decrees to sign. I got all this stuff going on just to be so busy that he didn't have to think about what he knew he did. Against you, God, you and only you have I sinned and done this evil thing in your sight. Remember, this is the prayer of repentance. Don't forget that. He's repenting. He's talking to God about what he's done. That you, that you, God, may be found just when you speak. So when your word is spoken, that it's just and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, my, and in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, I want to hang on here in just a second when we get done with this one. You desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden parts, you will make me to know wisdom. This is in the prayer of repentance that David is saying there needs to be truth in me. I can't any further go along without, and when you acknowledge the truth of your transgressions, your weaknesses, your sin, that you will help me know wisdom. We're to learn from these things. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. This is how we become washed and whiter than snow when we focus on God, when we focus on what Christ did for us, that's how you're washed white as snow that you can be in the kingdom. Nothing that you can do, he's asking God to wash him white as snow. Make me hear joy and gladness because you know, you know, your sin in your life causes you to sometimes not enjoy joy and gladness because you're repeating it in your head. You're just seeing, and then you sidetrack it. Then maybe it's somebody else's fault, right? Then we blame them for the sin in our lives. We point to some, whatever it is, we justify it somehow so we can find joy and gladness, right? But we're to admit that in our own heart. That's how we find joy and gladness. That the, this is such a key phrase here, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. The bones that God has broken in you, when you repent, rejoice. <laughs> That's awesome. Hide your face from my sins. God, I don't want you to look at them. Please, don't look at them and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me, just remember what we taught, met, met nail, what the, what the actual word of repentance meant? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore in me what I already fundamentally know. I know you created everything. I know I'm created in that. I know you're redeeming everything through Jesus Christ. Help me find joy in that again. Find joy in that because I'm trying to find it elsewhere and it doesn't seem to be working out too well. And uphold me by your gen generous spirit. This is so great. So he just poured out his heart to God, admitted his transgressions, asking God to wash him clean as snow, 
asking for a new heart, asking for the Holy Spirit not to leave him, and this is what we do as disciples. This is fundamental stuff, basic stuff, because now here's what you get to do when you live that way. Then, then, after all of this, after you've cleaned me white as snow, after you've washed me, then I will teach transgressors your ways. He's not saying, I'm going to go around and tell everybody how to not sin, point out everybody's sin, blame everybody for everything else. I'll admit what I have done, and you will wash me, and then when I see other sinners and transgressors, I will teach them this. I will teach them how to repent and focus and trust you, nothing else. And sinners shall be converted to you. It doesn't get any simpler. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. The God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. That's what we just did 10 minutes ago. That's what we come in here to do. I know some of you don't like to sing. I know some of you, I, I don't sing very well. But you know what? Who laughed? <laughs> Curtis is always in the heckling gallery. Just kidding. Thank you. You're right. I'm not a good singer. But here's the thing. Nobody cares. You need to come in here with a heart, a contrite heart, and sing. Because you know what? Sing those words. Sing those praises from your new washed heart. That's what we're praising I don't really like that song. It's a little too loud. I wish we'd do more hymns. And then why do we keep doing hymns? I really like the new stuff. It doesn't matter what the song is. Sing it from your heart. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you, this is so great, for you do not desire sacrifice. How many of you grew up thinking, all oh, your sacrifices, everything that you sacrifice is gonna impress God? Nah. I wish I had a button that could do it. Just, nah. He doesn't want your sacrifice. I don't know if you recall a couple of months ago, I did a message on before you walk in here to sing those songs, there's scripture that actually said that Christ said, if you walk in, to praise me, you walk in to, to be in my presence and you have anger in your heart to your brother, leave your gift, leave your sacrifice at the door, leave it, leave, get out of here, go reconcile with your brother, then come back and praise and sing in my church. It's exactly what he said. That's exactly what he's saying here. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You don't have a thing that you can sacrifice that God gives two hoots about. I'm sorry, but you don't. You have nothing that you can give that God would go, all right, cool, you're covered. Come on into the kingdom of God, you're all set. Man, you gave up your blah, blah, blah. You sacrificed for me. Christ said so many times in his teaching that he didn't want sacrifice, he wanted mercy, because guess what? That's what you got. That's what I received. We've received mercy because we don't deserve it. So it was given to us. So now that you have that, you're to give that to each other. And we don't do it. I'm sorry, we don't. You can sit there in your head and go, well, I do, I did that. And as soon as you start doing that, well... <laughs> Sorry, stop, time out. Don't, because you don't. You, you're gonna find out in the second half of this message today exactly what I'm talking about. You do not delight in burnt offerings. David is telling God what God delights in and doesn't because he knows. He knows it's his heart that needs to change, not the fact that he laid a bull on some fire and now God's impressed with what David did. 
The sacrifices are, of God are a broken spirit. <laughs> the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. You're supposed to have a broken spirit. Ready, go. A broken and contrite heart. That's what God is saying he wants. Because in Matthew 3, or Matthew 5, 3, when Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount, maybe this will make more sense to you after just reading David's prayer. Blessed, extremely blessed, that's what that means, exceedingly happy, <laughs> exceedingly happy are the poor in spirit. Did that ever make sense to you completely? Maybe it did. But for me, for many years, it didn't. I just went, yeah, yeah, and I've heard like other pastors or Bible, you have uh, Bible study classes and people just start talking and adding a bunch of words to it to make it sound like they're educated. But stop and think about what he's saying right there is exactly what David just said. You're blessed because your spirit is broken. Because guess what happens when it is? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If your spirit if you repent of the ugliness in your life and praise God for what he did through Christ and you sing praises and ask to be washed, believe in what Christ did, you have a broken spirit because you know you can't do anything about it. You've put your trust 100% in Christ. Yours is the kingdom of God. Without that contrite, broken heart, without your broken spirit, with absolute disgust and loathing for what you've done, not for you to sit there and wallow in your, you're like, oh, I'm such a horrible person. That's not what I'm saying. You cry out to God with that and ask that to be washed away, because guess what? It already has. And then, because you know it already has, you ask God to not have your, the, the Holy Spirit leave your, leave your heart. No, re, I want to retain it, Lord. Don't take that from me. Now you can lead others into the same type of lifestyle, and yours is the kingdom of God. It's basic, fundamental. Let's start there. Let's understand this. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing when you read your scriptures. God said David was a man after his own heart. Did you ever question that a little bit too? Just I mean, You had to have at least once or twice when you read that line. So whereabouts was David chasing after God's heart? We just read it. We just read it. He had an unbelievable broken and contrite heart because he knew and knows who God is and he violated God's law, and only God did he violate. Did you catch that when he said that? That is why God said, he is a man after my own heart. Not because of his lack of sinning. It's because his heart was broken because of it. I'm gonna continue. These, I'm still in Psalm 51 now. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. This is building the church back up. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with the burnt offering and the whole burnt offering. Do you understand what just happened? He's saying once you go through this whole process, now you can bring your sacrifices. Now I will accept them. Isn't that Cain and Abel right out of the gate? Essentially, right out of church, Cain goes and kills Abel because of his guilt and his frustration and of, and of his sin. Because he didn't bring the sacrifice. He didn't love his brother. So he went to church. He didn't leave his gift at the door and go reconcile. He just came right in and offered his weak gift. Do you ever think it was because he didn't give maybe the best grain? 
We used to sit there and think, well, maybe he went, oh, here's my best grain, but this stuff's not so good, I'll bring that. I don't think that's it. Because everything in Christ's teaching is about the heart, not about the gift or the sacrifice. It was about his heart. He came with an angry heart. He wanted to, he already murdered his brother. He already did it. And he showed up at church and God told him, I don't want it. I don't want your sacrifice. But now that you have done all this, now God's saying, bring me your sacrifices because now it's out of love. You're here praising me out of love. And they shall offer bulls on your altar. Jesus was hanging out with sinners his entire ministry And the Pharisees were constantly complaining about it. And this is what Christ actually said to them in Matthew 9, 12, and 13. Those who are well have no need of a physician. So what he's saying is is if you don't have this broken heart, this broken spirit, you don't need God. You got it handled. You're good. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinner, but the sinners to repentance. Everything we just talked, he's calling them to do what we just discussed. David also said, if you remember back in, 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 in the Psalm 51, he said, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and then there you will provide me, what you will give me wisdom. This is what I want you to take at this point because I want you to understand that's where you gain wisdom. The stories that you're about to hear is you're, you might laugh a little bit, you might be a, a little bit, uh, it might be funny and you might feel weird laughing at it, but it's okay. But it's funny and it's not funny because the, some of the stories that you're gonna hear are people that didn't have a broken and contrite heart but then after realizing their sin, did. And, the, and we beat ourselves up for this, but these are the stories. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I am. I want to introduce you to my friend. And, and I know everybody says, give him a good round of applause. But you know what? It does feel good to be recognized and honored, doesn't it? And, and this man does deserve and applause because he's been my best friend since the first day of sixth grade, and I'm gonna be 52. So you do the math. It's been a long time, and he's put up with a lot of stuff, but I think you're gonna hear a couple of really cool stories, and then we'll explain to you exactly why you heard him. My friend Bruce Bradford Royal. (laughs) Thank you, everybody. I want to tell you a story that I didn't plan on telling you real quick because Kevin talked about sacrifice and offerings. I was picking my son up from school, Grand Haven Christian School. He was nine years old, and it was Easter season, and he came running out of the school, and he said, Daddy, this kid's a servant. He's a servant heart. He's a nonstop giver. Daddy, I know what I'm giving up for Lent. I was like, awesome. What are you thinking? He goes, well, you know how you're supposed to give up something you really love that's really important to you? I said, yeah. He goes, well, hear me out. I'm going to do my best to do this. I'm not going to help people all through Lent. <laughs> Dead serious. I mean, he was pumped. Like, he, he discovered this thing that he wanted to give up. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, because it matters a lot to me. I love being there for people and helping people. But I'm not going to do it at all. <laughs> all through Lent. I was like, dude, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join you in that. He goes, Really? I said, yeah, get out. You're walking home. <laughs> is that? This is what Kevin has on the, on the screen for me to look at. My <laughs> laughing face. <laughs> I thought you would have put that up right after No, you. now you see, it threw me off. Now, what was I talking about? All right. I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much for Kevin and for a lifelong friendship. And I thank you for this congregation. And I pray that this message that uh, I'm about to share, the story I'm about to share, is received as it's given, which is a a message of looking at our kingdom compared to your kingdom and helping us focus on you. Amen. 
So I've been married for coming up on 25 years. Next month will be 25 years. And I don't know if those of you that have been married for a long time have ever been in a, in a car ride that got not fighty, but just kind of like argument. I call them car arguments, where you're arguing in the car. I don't call them that. I just thought of it while I was sitting there. So my wife and I were going to drive to my son's basketball game a couple of weeks ago. And it's a 45-minute drive. It was just the two of us. And we had not been alone to have a conversation in a really long time. So I was looking forward to it. I was driving, and we got a block down the road, and, and she got on her phone, and she was doing the, you know how people do the swipe. And it, I just don't, I, the swipe makes me crazy. And she was swiping, but she was doing stuff. I could tell she was doing stuff. And uh, I didn't want to be a jerk, like, get off your phone. But I said, hey, could you, you know, could you set your phone aside? I just want to talk for a little bit. And she's like, well, it's not like I'm on Facebook. I said, well, I don't, whatever it is you're on, I don't care if it's Napster or Instagram or whatever it is, I want to have a conversation with you. So she, like, tosses her phone down. Fine, what do you want to talk about? I was doing stuff for the house. I was like, okay, well, I just want to talk to you about a couple things, and we talked. And then that was the end of the conversation. And it wasn't argue but it was just that awkward, we're not talking to each other kind of vibe. And there was like a cloud. Not bad, but not comfortable. And before I realized it, we were like five minutes into this drive, and there's no conversation. We're just looking ahead. And when you're in that mode in a car, the silence is deafening. If you're in a house, at least you can work around each other and, and go to a different room, but you're sitting right next to that person that's got you so upset. And she's looking ahead, and I'm looking ahead, and now we're 10 minutes in. And by now, I'm having a dialogue with God. I'm like, God, I know you love her. I love her too. She's my best friend. I know what I'm supposed to do in this situation. However, <laughs> she started it. <laughs> And she needs to learn a lesson, so I'm just going to sit here in my wisdom and just drive. And now, and she's going to, I'm not talking first. There's no way. Now we're, I mean, it's 15 minutes, and now it feels like 15 hours, and I'm dialed in. I'm just like, I'm hunkered down. I'm like, I got my hand on the wheel, and it's raining and just kind of ugly out, and everything's ugly. And <laughs> she's just staring ahead. I haven't even looked at her in 15 minutes. And, and I just see out of my peripheral vision, she's looking ahead, like, okay, all right. Listen, I'm going to, and this is, I'm talking to God, the creator of everything, and I'm saying this to him. This is so bad. I'm like, you know, I don't even know, now, because the devil's whispering in my ear. How is it you can't even bring up a, a topic of conversation with her getting mad at you? All you wanted to do was to talk to her. You need to speak your truth, boy. You need to share. I mean, she needs to listen. <laughs> She's not even listening. There's a wall. I'm like, oh, I'm not talking first. 20 minutes of just driving, 20 quiet minutes. And I'm, now I told God, I said, I will sit through the JV game and the varsity game right next to her without saying in a word, unless she talks first. If she talks first, I will engage. I will, 20 minutes. I will, God, I know you know I always offer to drop her off at the front door because I'm supposed to do that. It's a nice guy thing to do. I'm still gonna do it but I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to pull up, I'm going to drop off, and I'm not saying a word. 25 <laughs> minutes of deafening silence. We're almost to the game, and I, I finally said to God, I know that she's dug in. She's dug in. My heels are dug in so deep. There is no possible way I'm going to give in. She will speak the first word, and she did when she said, Oh my gosh, that was so refreshing. How long was I asleep? <laughs> I said 25 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> she said, why do you look psychotic? I said, because I am. You don't even know how many times I was tapping the brake to get that head bob thing going. I was w wiggling the steering wheel to watch her head bob. I was losing my mind for 25 minutes. 
And she said, oh my gosh, Bruce, you need to tell that story on stage. I was like, all right, I'll tell that story on stage. As a matter of fact, we went out, we had a double date with uh, a couple of friends of ours shortly after that happened, like the weekend after it happened. She said, you got to tell the story. And so I told the story, and they were dying laughing, because it's a great, I, don't, I didn't fabricate any of it. It's such a great God story. It's not just a story of my own buffoonery. It's a story of how God works. And so I told the story, and this was her response, and I adore this woman. But she said in her totally cute little innocent voice, she goes, yeah, it's hilarious because I was innocent in the whole thing. I was like, you started the whole thing by flipping through the phone. And she goes, but I wasn't like on Facebook. I go, I don't care if you were on Facebook. I was doing house stuff to take care of you and get our schedule cleared out. I was doing all the things that I need to do to make sure that house runs. I was like, but that's not the point. So now we're right back at it. We didn't talk the whole way home. So as the dust settled from that insanity that I put myself through, I did all that. I manufactured that whole thing. I sat there and I thought, I spent 25 minutes of my life just in this crippling psycho, I wasn't in a rage, but I was like in my head, all these these frustrations. And for 25 minutes, I was either looking up into that rear view mirror. I I would not look over here. Had I just done that, none of this would have happened. I wouldn't look here, so I'm either looking into the rear view mirror, focusing on everything behind me, all the brokenness, all the frustration, all the rage, all the anger, all the they did this, she did that, I didn't do this, I did that, no fair. (laughs) Or I'm looking into the windshield, one of two directions, because when I get there, I'm looking in the windshield, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, here's what I'm going to do. If I would have just taken a, a, a minute, a second, and looked into that rearview mirror and seen with abhorrence the destruction of my decisions, and rep- instead of using that to fuel the anger of all this, to fuel what I'm going to do in the future, because this is my kingdom, my kingdom. Had I looked with abhorrence in the rearview mirror and seen that catastrophe that I caused, repented, and used it to fuel myself going forward, that's the difference. I feel like God gave me multiple, I think multiple things happened. I believe three things, two things at least, happened. Um, I believe that the rearview mirror is my kingdom. This is my kingdom. And I don't think God necessarily manufactured that moment. I don't think he made it all happen. I don't know, maybe he did. But he was at least a part of it. He was there, and I think, first off, I think he was sitting there going, oh my gosh, he doesn't even realize she's sleeping. He's making a fool of himself. This is going to be hilarious when she wakes up. I think he was there for that. But I also think he was saying, this is, this is your kingdom, Bruce. This is what you have built. This is your kingdom. This is the anger, frustration, and rage. Instead of using those for negatives, use those to repent and spend more time in my word, in a relationship with me, focused on my kingdom. Thank you. Can you tell the one real quick about the, the intersection? This one's my I'm going to sound thing. like a road rage freak because this is all car <laughs> stuff. <laughs> So this guy looked at me weird, and I started raining down elbows on him. No. Which intersection? Because there are two intersection stories. The one where you dangled the... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, no. That, that sounded weird. <laughs> okay, so same nine-year-old kid, same school, Grand Haven Christian School. I had to go and pick him up from school one day, and it was a rough day to begin with. It was a really rough day because... I was, in my, I was in super judgy mode. A, a couple things happened, and I was just in a bad place, and this person's bad, and this person's dumb, and this person didn't do this right. Just cloudy all day. So I go to pick up my kid at a Christian school, and I park out front. He comes bopping out all happy again, gets in my car, and we came to an intersection. And I'm at the, it's a four-way stop. And I'm parked, and I'm already amped, but I'm just pretending to be the dad that he thinks I am. Hey, buddy! <laughs> 
<laughs> Everything's great. I'm not a psycho at all. And so I'm sitting at the stop sign, <laughs> and nobody's going this way, but the guy facing me, he was there when I, he was there at his stop sign before I arrived at mine. I pull up, I stop, we're looking at each other, and I go, go ahead. And he goes, uh-uh, go ahead. I'm like, okay. First off, <laughs> you're there first. It's your turn. Secondly, I did the go ahead thing, and I did it nicely. I, did, I, was like, I was like, hey, come on. So two reasons out of two that you need to go. <laughs> and he, and he, he's like, no, go ahead. And I looked at him like, no. <laughs> you, come on. Christian, oh, you Christian, wait. Christian, Christian school, Christian school right here. <laughs> Christian son right here. He's just looking at me like, what's, what's going on, Daddy? I'm like, don't worry about it. I got this. This guy, he's going. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, you're a move, buddy. And uh, I'm going, come on. He looks at me, and he goes, you, go. I was like, oh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> One of my spiritual gifts is sarcasm. <laughs> and I looked at this guy, and I looked into his soul, and I went, no, 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 no. You go. And he's like, What'd you move? And this is like, this is bam, bam. It's like a tennis match. Whack, whack, back and forth. And finally, he's like, double fingers, you go. And I promise you I did this in front of my son, in front of a Christian school. I'm sitting at the light. I look at him. I pull my keys out of the ignition, <laughs> threw them on the dashboard. I'm like, now what? And he guns it, wow! And he blows by me, I'm like, yeah! And I looked over my son, he's like, Daddy, what just happened? <laughs> that guy was trying to be nice. He was trying to let you go. I was like, no, 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 no. You gotta understand. This, I was being courteous, he was being controlling. And that, that was how we left the Christian school that day. So a, a day of judgment and anger in my psycho head, I went home that night, and I went to the Bible, and I walked by it, and I felt God say, you got to pick it up and read it. I was like, I'll read twice as much tomorrow. I'm really grumpy right now. <laughs> pick it up. Trust me. I'm like, I do trust you, but I'm really tired, and I'm really angry. And he said, pick it up. And I picked it up, went to a random place in the book. I don't even know what it is, which verse it is, but whack. And I came down to a verse that said, with your tongue, you worship your Lord and father, and with it you curse your brother. And I went, oh. <laughs> Message received. So <laughs> that was the only other time I was a psycho in the car. The only time. <laughs> Except on the way to church this morning, some guy. <laughs> There's a reason for those stories. And the funny thing that he forgot to tell you, which I thought was really cool when he called me up to tell me all about it when it first happened, he goes, and I had a cross hanging over my mirror, staring through it, just uh, and, and all this good stuff. And uh, there's a reason why, the other reason for, for telling you those stories is I'm going to tell you one more about Da Vinci. And I don't know if you know this story or not, but uh, Da Vinci was, uh, I, 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 it was a, I'm just going to call it a king. I can't remember what the term was. We'll just say the king hired Da Vinci to paint the Last Supper. Do you guys know this story? The, he's painting the, the he was get, and put in charge of painting the Last Supper. His very good friend, his very good friend, kept telling the king, he'll never finish it. He'll never finish. He never finishes anything. That more or less demeaning Da Vinci the whole time that he's supposed to be putting this Last Supper together. He starts out because he's so mad at his friend. He paints Judas first, and his model is his best friend. So he paints his best friend as Judas. And then he starts painting all the other disciples and this and that. And this is going on for months and, you know, going on. And then it comes down to the center of the picture and he's trying to paint Jesus. He sits there and he paints Jesus. He steps back and looks at it and he goes, doesn't look right. Scrapes it all off, does it again and again and again and again. And he can't get it right. And then he realized he broke down in his own brokenness. And he realized that he had such anger in his heart for his best friend that he couldn't paint Jesus. So he scraped off Judas, repainted it, 
I should have got a picture of it. I didn't even think about that. I should have put it. And then he painted that masterpiece. He couldn't do it. He couldn't paint Jesus. We never can paint Jesus through non-repentance. You can't. And the reason for these stories is I, the first story, if you notice, that Bruce told was a relationship with a spouse. And the second story, the reason why I wanted him to tell it is because it was a relationship with a stranger. And then Da Vinci's story is somebody that's a friend. And what I want you to get out of today, I'm not saying you gotta work on all three of those, but pick one of them to, I, I can't think of a better word. I watched some sermons from a, from a guy named Craig Groeschel in the last couple of weeks, and he had this sermon called Predecide, and I can't think of a better word than just to use it and give him credit for it, is predecide that, we'll just take the intersection story, is if you know you go down darkness coming up to an intersection, because no one does it right at an intersection, do they? You're the only one. You're the only one that does it right, and you're the only one that's nice, right? Isn't that how it works at every single four-way stop? So pre-decide, before you get there, you're gonna seek the kingdom of God first. Because he had no peace in that situation, did he? The stranger had no peace in that situation. His son didn't have any peace of God. In the Nobody was living in the kingdom of God. Nobody got to experience it. It didn't exist. But if you drive into it, knowing that you're gonna seek the kingdom of God first, just that one scenario in your life, it could be anything. Just pick one that always causes you, because you know what's crazy about what he did to his, I'm sorry, I know I'm jumping around, what he did with his wife in this scenario and what he did with his friend and what, da Vin or what he did with the stranger and what he did with his wife and what da Vinci did with his friend, Christ called that murder. He said, David murdered Bathsheba's husband and you murder people all day long. Christ said it's the same thing. It's no different. If you say, Raka, you're a fool, you've committed murder. So we don't get to justify David's sins are any different than Bruce's when he was sitting at that stoplight. It's no different. He murdered that man in Christ's eyes. Can't get around it. So where repentance comes in is when he calls me up and we start talking about it, and then we realize, man, I didn't honor God at all. So now I have a broken heart. Now I have a broken spirit. Look what I did. I did this in front of my son. I ruined, you know, it's, that's where God wants you to be, in that spot, so you can understand and learn the truth and get the wisdom of the truth in your heart to then go, I need to start seeking the kingdom of God first. In the scenario of the guy at the corner, he could, when the guy waved him on, he could have just went and prayed for him along the way as they're passing each other, gave him a peace sign or or like, hey, what? gave the guy some love. Just go, right? And ju just decide, pre-decide when you get there what you're gonna do, regardless of how you feel. Whatever scenario you have in life, whether it's your, the spousal scenario, if you're one of those people that go down those, if, if things aren't happening, you're just spinning out of control, the stranger, Da Vinci story, just pick one of them or all of them. And this is what I'm trying to do right now in my life. I'm trying to seriously go, this is the, if we want the, if we want to exist in the kingdom of God, when he redeems everything, we have to decide right now to live in it. Right now. And how it looks is not sitting at the street corners like that, not riding with our spouses like that, and not painting our friends in an ugly light. It's not. So here is what I'm trying to do when I start to feel that the guy at the, 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 the four corners, the spousal, the friend, the, whatever it is in your life, when you start to feel that, this is where I'm going. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, 
And if none of those are there, how about this? If there is any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So when you're, at, when you're heading up to the stoplight, you know you're coming up to the four-way intersection. What is pure here? What is lovely? What is kind? What is beautiful? What is praiseworthy? Find it because you'll see it. When you're sitting in the car with your spouse, something's going wrong, or, and it's just kids, whatever, it doesn't matter who's in the car. Things are twisting out of shape. What, I'll just use his scenario, what is kind and lovely about this woman? What is noteworthy? What is praiseworthy? And you start rolling through that, I guarantee he'd start rolling off things like crazy. She's a wonderful mother. I love her. She takes care of my house. She takes care of my kids. She takes care of everything that I don't. Da, 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 da. He would just sit there and roll. And then he would start praising God. Thank you for my wife. Thank you, Lord. Would you not? Seeking the kingdom of God first. Then remember what uh, David said? And then I will be able to teach other transgressors. So now you learn this behavior. You actually repent of this ugliness and then ask God to truthfully fix you. And now people are seeing what you're doing. Now the few, look, I'm not picking him. He knows I'm not. Look what he taught his son. How to handle a four-way intersection. When it could have been, and it will be, and I know him well enough to know that he's changed that, to go, no, son, this is how, your dad handled it wrong. Let me explain to you how I should have handled it. And now you start to do that. Now our children, we're actually teaching other sinners how to seek the kingdom of God first because you pre-decided to do it. Because you want to usher in that kingdom, you want to be a part of it, so make it real now. That's all I got. If there isn't anything in there that you can't find lovely, kind, and beautiful, and noteworthy, give me a call. We'll sit down and chat about it. But I am telling you from the bottom of my heart, this has to change. It's the only way to foundationally, foundationally do we change a church. It's the only way to become a disciple. It's the only way if you don't accept who God is, understand his plan for redemption, buy into it, love it, repent of it, praise God for it, and come here and thank him for it, get it into your heart and your soul, and then when others ask you, why are you, why do you act so weird at four-way intersections? Why are you praying for people and waving at everybody, even if it makes yourself laugh? Just do whatever you have to to change that. People, when they ask you then, now you have an answer of why. Because I need to seek the kingdom of God first because I haven't been. But I'm expecting God to show up in all these wonderful ways in our life. Aren't we? We're expecting, I'll just use his scenario again. He's expecting God to change his wife, isn't he? You're expecting God to change your husband, change your kids, change thy friend, change this, change that. Well, guess what? You need to seek the kingdom of God first. And then what did he say? Then after that, all these other desires of your heart, I'll do it. You have to trust the fact, and maybe he won't every single time. But if you did that, how do we not know that his wife wouldn't have woke up and just went, I love you. I'm sorry. I had a rough day. I appreciate the fact that you love me and you wanted to just spend time with me. How do we not know that that would have happened? We never even gave it a shot. And even if it doesn't, you're supposed to find what is lovely, what is kind. Just do it again. Bob Goff, I don't know if you've ever read any of his stuff, Great books, love everyone always. He, he says, give grace and peace, and I'll end with this, give grace and peace and love and forgive every 30 seconds. And no matter what situation you're dealing, he says, you can give anybody 30 seconds. 
Just sit there and count the 30 in your head. Somebody's driving you nuts. They're right here, and you just want to rock a you fool. You want to murder this person in your heart. But instead, you go, what is lovely? What is kind? For 30 seconds, you do that. And if they're still doing it, he said, start over. Just do another 30 seconds until it's done and over with or that God changes your heart. And you just did Just 30 seconds. Anyway, if you want to come up, I'm going to, I want you to just think about this. And what I want you to think about is where in your life, just for a minute or two, and then we're going to play the last song, is just where you can seek the kingdom of God first in your life. Lord, I ask you to uh, bless every, you already have blessed every single person in here. Help them to realize how unbelievably blessed they are when their heart and spirit is broken because that's exactly where you said you want us because that's when you show up because we realize it's you and only you. Wow. In your name, amen.